Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, as part of Globalizing Calgary Tech Volume 4. I am Terry Rock. I'm the President and CEO of Platform Calgary. We are excited to continue exploring and learning together from other tech and innovation leaders from around the world. Today, we have people joining us from Vietnam, from Sweden, from uh, Switzerland, from the US, from all over the world. We're excited to welcome you to this conversation here in Calgary. We all play a, an important role in taking Calgary and Alberta to the next level and to work together to strengthen and build a ro more robust tech and startup community. Today, we're exploring cities and ecosystems around the world that are leading in technology and innovation. Outside of the normal ones, in some cases, that you would normally uh, think of, but the Platform Calgary team is a, a group of certifiable nerds about this stuff. And the people we have today are really Platform Calgary's greatest hits. If there was a Spotify year-end uh, listing of the organizations that we paid most attention to, the six that are here today would be on that list. We're excited because we've got leaders from Stockholm, from Frankfurt, from Helsinki, from Houston, from Brooklyn in the US, uh, in, in New York, uh, and from closer to home from Waterloo. And the exciting news is that Calgary will soon be opening its first innovation center in the fall of 2021. And Platform Calgary is leading that work together with over 45 partners that have signed on to be part of that story. If you want to learn more, visit our website at platformcalgary.com. We're very uh, focused on the future, but it's also very important to recognize that we are building on something that was gifted to us. And in the spirit of respect, recipro reciprocity, and truth, we honor and acknowledge that we are coming to you from Mokinstis, the traditional Treaty 7 territory and the oral practices of Blackfoot Confederacy, the Siksika, the Gainai, the Pikani, as well as the Stony Nakoda and Sutena nations. We acknowledge that this territory is home to the Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3, within the historical Northwest Métis homeland. Finally, we acknowledge all nations, Indigenous and non, who live, work, play, innovate, and build things on this land, and in so doing, honor and celebrate this territory. We will be recording today's session to share with those who are not able to join live. If you have questions, please share them in the Q&A to panelists and all attendees so everyone can see, so we can address those questions as they come up. Without further ado, I'd like to welcome the Honorable Doug Black uh, to share a few words. Senator Black was elected by Albertans as Senator in Waiting in 2012 and was subsequently appointed to the Senate in January of 2013. Prior to serving in the Senate, he practiced law and served as a board member advisor to several Canadian businesses. He, is, uh, he was appointed to Queen's Council in 2002 and was named in 2012 as one of Canada's most influential lawyers by Canadian Lawyer Magazine. He is an honorary co-chair of our advisory roundtable. He is an amazing Calgarian and amazing Canadian. Thank you for joining us today, Senator Black, over to you. Well, thank you, Terry. Uh, am I live? Everything okay here? You are. Okay, let's, absolutely. Oh, I got to push an okay. Here we go. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to folks who are participating. And I share in Terry's excitement. I am really looking forward to today's uh, roundtable. The reason is, for me, is as we build anything, whether it's a family, a career, a business, a political campaign, we learn from other folks. And today is about learning. So the question I ask myself is how do we build platform to help energize Calgary by providing meaningful space, connections and programs for our startup creators, funders, mentors and friends. So today is about taking lessons from those around the world who frankly are ahead of us on this journey. And what better way to learn than to learn from others who have experienced success. And that is exactly what we're going to have the privilege of doing this morning. So to guide our conversations, we have a tremendous moderator in Dr. Brianne Everett. Let me tell you just a quick little bit about her. I could spend the next hour talking about the accomplishments of Brianne, but that's not the purpose of this morning. So Dr. Everett is the CEO, president, and co-founder of Orpix Medical Technologies a company here in Calgary, a company which creates medical grade wearable technologies with unique pressure sensors to help prevent diabetic foot ulcers. 
This is important work. Dr. Everett has been recognized as the graduate of the last decade from the University of Calgary and has been named one of the top 100 most powerful women in Canada. She has received the Governor General's Innovation Award. We are so proud of what Brianne is doing, has done, and I know is going to do. So join me in welcoming Dr. Brianne Everett to introduce the panel and sit back, enjoy, and learn together. Thanks so much. Talk to you soon. Awesome. Thank you so much, Senator Black. It's, uh, it's such a pleasure to be here today. Um, I think that I feel very honored as a, a stakeholder within the innovation ecosystem in Calgary to, to be part of the, the panel discussion today and to, to learn more. Um, in the, the preliminary call leading up to this meeting, um, one, of the, one of the things that Terry had mentioned, which I thought was really exciting, um, was that the promise that the Platform Innovation Centre has, which is to uh, to basically, with 15 minutes within that that facility, get you on the right track as a, as a founder and an innovator. And I think that that's a that's a really that's a really big goal. I think it would be tremendous to be to be at a place where we could say that. And so I think today is a great opportunity to figure out how some of these top innovation centers in the world have done that well, um, so that we can emulate and create a really powerful ecosystem here in Calgary. So um, before we get started, just one quick question or one quick note, um, and I, I know Terry mentioned this earlier, but please make sure that any questions that come up over the course of the panel uh, get put in the Q&A tool, not in the chat. Um, obviously, we, we certainly welcome your feedback and, and um, commentary in the chat as well, but for questions, please move them to the Q&A. All right, so let's get started. Um, we'll introduce our panelists. I'll, I'll just allow each of the panelists to say a few words about who they are, um, what their role is, and what organization they're with today. So why don't we get started with Henna from Stockholm. Yeah, hello, good morning, I guess, to Calgary. Hi, uh, everyone, we're a pleasure to be here. My name is Henna Keranen. I'm uh, working at Sting. Um, which is an accelerator and incubator here in, in Stockholm. And at Sting, I'm responsible for our partnerships, uh, for the startup community, and in general, the external relations staff. And I've been working with Sting for four years now, and it has been truly fun. Awesome. Welcome. Um, all right, Hugo from Tech Court in Frankfurt. Yes. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Hugo Baquet. I am... Uh, a uh, Canadian, actually, that now lives in Frankfurt, Germany. Uh, so for the last three years, I have been involved in uh, building the community and uh, startup ecosystem here in Frankfurt uh, at TechWart here. And uh, yeah, talking about it is actually one of my favorite things. So uh, looking forward to share some of our learnings here and uh, maybe do some trace some parallels with uh, my previous experience, which was uh, in Montreal working for the city's innovation district. So. Uh, thanks again for the invitation and looking forward. Great. Um, Abby from Communitech in Waterloo. Thank you, Brianne, and good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm really pleased to be with you this morning. So my name is Abby Peters, and I'm part of the leadership team at Communitech in Waterloo Region, Ontario. Uh, my focus is on building strong ecosystem partnerships working uh, with our public sector and private sector investors and partners to advance the work that we do. Uh, I also have the pleasure of leading one of our national initiatives, which is a network of innovation hubs right across the country. And proud to say that Platform Calgary is one of our members. So really pleased to be here today and I look forward to the discussion. Fantastic, thanks for joining us. Uh, Jessica from Helsinki and Maria. Yes, good morning, everybody. It's, it's great to be here. And actually, good evening from Helsinki. Uh, thank you for having me here today. Uh, briefly about me, uh, Jessica Blekingberg. I work as the Chief Network Officer at Maria01. Uh, we are a startup and community place incubating startups, investors, and corporate partners uh, together. Uh, really excited to be here today, share more about what we're doing, and uh, can't wait to learn more also from all the other panelists. Thank you for having me. Fantastic. Um, Remington from the Canon in Houston. 
Thanks, Maria. I appreciate it. Remington Tonar here, everybody, representing the Canon in Houston. Uh, we're the largest startup incubator in Houston and one of the largest in Texas. We have four locations across the state, four more on the way in Texas, Oklahoma, uh, and some other states here in the U.S. as well. Uh, and we focus on connecting founders and startups to the people they need uh, to know, uh, create programs they need to succeed, and provide all of the places they need to uh, spark inspiration, collaboration, and serendipity. Uh, my background is in venture fund management and innovation consulting for Fortune 500s, and uh, really looking forward to the conversation today. Awesome. Thanks for joining us. And Satish with New Lab in Brooklyn. Sorry, I didn't mute. I didn't unmute. Uh, hey guys, uh, this is Satish Ram. I'm part of the leadership team at New Lab. We are a community of engineers, entrepreneurs, designers, um, and companies located in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Um, we uh, we've repurposed an old sh uh, former shipbuilding facility here that's now a collaborative space that has on-site prototyping. We support our startup members to, to help them grow. Um, we engage them in product development and pilot opportunities with our industry and government partners. We start new ventures and we invest and looking forward to talking uh, more with everyone. Awesome, welcome. So um, we have just an incredible panel here today and I think that there's so much that we can learn from, from what you've done well and how you've succeeded in really creating um, very strong ecosystems within, within your cities via, via innovation centers. So um, one, of the, one of the areas that we really wanna focus on today is is how with innovation centers, uh, your communities have been able to build these ecosystems and trust within those ecosystems to really, really generate um, significant and measurable impacts within your communities. So um, let's get started by, uh, now that we know who, who who's at the table, um, be great to, to get a, a sense of um, what do your organizations do? I know that um, in uh, Remington had previously mentioned that the focus and the framework that that is is used at the Canyon is one of a focus on people, place, and programs. So if we could get started by just going around the table and understanding what are your core pro programs, how have you developed the physical spaces that you work in, and how um, how you stand out, or how you have have certainly made your your innovation centers stand out in a global innovation uh, community. So um, maybe we'll just go in the same order. We'll start with, with Hannah. Sure. So Sting, uh, we, I would say that we are beyond an accelerator and incubator. We are more like an ecosystem for startups. Um, we have been up and running for 18 years now. So we are a pretty long you know, actor within this space. And the original idea of Sting was to um, support, you know, these small businesses in Sweden, uh, aiming to become these expert companies and global companies uh, because we saw the potential uh, back in the days that actually small companies are, are making uh, good, you know, export opportunities and uh, the growth, uh, growth rates are huge. And then, you know, people started to discuss about startups and tech companies. And so we also, of course, developed our niche uh, and in that sense created an incubator. Uh, and an accelerator. And today I would say that our USP um, is probably that, that we actually support startups in all the possible stages that you can imagine. Um, so we have coaching, we have financing, we have a physical space here in Stockholm. Of course now um, more the physical space I would say is on Zoom. Um, but then we also have a very, very strong community supporting each other constantly um, with more than 320 uh, alumni companies as well. Um, so that's a very huge crowd with a lot of like knowledge as well. Um, we help them with their recruitment, their marketing, PR. So any kind of like support that you can just, you know, imagine. And the whole idea is actually to, to provide the, the small, small, small tech startup, the kind of like resources that corporates have. Uh, so we are kind of like the different departments for them. Um, yeah, so in, in that sense, this is how, how we're built and what is like our, our USP for uh, for startups. Awesome. You go. Yes, sure. So uh, TechWork here is much younger. So we were actually started in 2016. I think that's a reflection of how the ecosystem here is a bit uh, also uh, on its way to growth. So it's a less mature ecosystem than, say, Berlin uh, or Paris. 
Uh, so at the time, even co-working was a scarce uh, commodity. So we also started with the place and then uh, the community came, so the people, and then now we also run programs. So uh, it's very much, um, you know, we have a, an innovation space where we run our different formats, where we uh, organize events and allow people to come together and, and connect. Uh, we are facilitating this and uh, because Frankfurt is such a, um, I guess, you know, it's a business a banking city, it's a financial center, uh, it's part of the DNA of the ecosystem, these stakeholders are involved also in the way that we support startups. So our approach is very much one of a bridge between those startups, a lot of fintechs, a lot of B2B companies that caters to the industry. So we stand at the nexus of all these forces, along with a, a very strong basis of uh, university partners. So we have a, also a, a strong academic back backing, and um, there's a huge talent pool in the region. So basically, TQ tries to harness all those forces into a, a productive uh, innovation experience. Yeah, it's so interesting because there, there are so many parallels between Frankfurt and Calgary and the establishment of an, an innovation ecosystem in a, a city that has otherwise been dominated by one industry, in this case, oil and gas. Um, if you had one one thing that, that you could tell uh, us as starting this ecosystem in Calgary um, to do, to do that well, what, what would you say? Um, so... I think so, so I can maybe yeah, make you skip a step. So at the beginning, I think we, we were in really this honeymoon, right? Like the new kid on the block, oh, this cool innovation center. And we didn't fall into a trap, but there's a lot of this, what we call innovation theater, right? Like there's a lot of just having an event and putting people in a room doesn't make innovation happen. But for many corporates, that might be enough, you know, for... Uh, they sign the check, they're happy with that, but in a few years, they will ask to see, you know, what's the return? What are the real results? What is the impact that you can generate? So I think that's, that's the mature, uh, you know, that's the learning curve that uh, from the get-go, if you already start focusing on the KPIs, on what tangible impact you want to have, not only on those sponsors or corporate partners, but also on the community itself, think about, you know, uh, the positive change, like in the sense of sustainability, perhaps, that's also one of our core values. So I think focusing on impact is just really the, the golden rule. That's a great, great advice. Um, awesome. Okay, Avi. Hi, uh, so Communitech has been around since 1997. We were founded by a group of entrepreneurs uh, our model has uh, always been rooted in the fact that we help uh, technology companies right across their life cycle. So we work with very small early stage businesses, we work with scaling companies, and we work with large enterprises as well. Uh, and similar to what's been described, our, our model centers around three pillars. Um, place is very important to the work that we do. The programming that we uh, build and deliver for our clients is the second pillar. And the third is, is that notion of ecosystem, the partnerships required uh, to generate positive outcomes in the ecosystem. So the, the, the place um, is important for us because Waterloo Region is a really small community. There's only about half a million people here. Uh, and while we're now known as a, a tech ecosystem, uh, that's a relatively recent development. We've primarily been known over our history as um, as a, a manufacturing community, uh, an insurance community. Tech is sort of the newest development, the newest flavor of entrepreneurship and innovation, if you will. So a lot of the work that we do is really to try and convene an ecosystem uh, for uh, tech companies in the region and help them overcome uh, what we often see as their most common barriers to growth, uh, access to talent, access to capital, and access to customers and markets. And because we're a small community and a relatively recent uh, industry, um, the, the partnership dimension of what we do is one of the most important ways that we're able to do that. Because we as a single organization uh, simply aren't gonna be able to leverage all the resources required to help our companies be successful. It's really more about the networks we are able uh, to tap into and the partnerships that we're able to build. Uh, it allows us to bring more um, support to bear. 
to help our companies be successful. So interesting because uh, it, to, to think about that transition from manufacturing to tech, because from, from somebody who is not in Waterloo and, and the innovation corridor there, um, Waterloo is very synonymous now with tech. So you've obviously done a very good job of, of that transition. Um, what role do you think uh, Communitech has played in, in that, that clear transition and success in that rel related, relative to the, the external brand of Waterloo? I think uh, that transition from a, a primarily manufacturing economy to a more diversified economy, um, our Communitech hub facility is one of the early examples of that shift and we were able to build the facility by working in very close partnership with um, our municipal governments who set as a goal of their own economic development agenda, the desire to uh, diversify the economy, particularly what was happening in downtown Kitchener, which was really hollowed out uh, when manufacturing started to decline. And they made some very deliberate investments in um, healthcare, in innovation and technology we were one of the delivery partners for those investments and and building our innovation hub was one of the, the first, I would say, markers of us starting to see that shift. I think one of the roles that Communitech has also played uh, has been a uh, local storyteller, cheerleader, champion of, um, of the tech and innovation story uh, for the community. We spend a lot of time celebrating uh, our local heroes. So those individuals who have founded companies, built successful companies, um, sometimes have done it over and over again. That, that notion of holding up uh, examples of people who've been successful, been there, done that, that's actually been one of the most powerful things that we have in order to show new entrepreneurs or first time entrepreneurs, uh, the art of the possible. Yeah. I think the, the, the power of storytelling and narrative generation examples just really can't be underestimated in, in building that sense of community. That's, that's awesome. Great, okay, Jessica. All right, so maybe a bit about the history also, Maria 01 and sort of how the city also has played a pretty significant part of it. Um, we were established in 2016, so we're fairly young uh, as well. And uh, some of you might know that we are located in an old hospital in the city of Helsinki. A bit of background related to that uh, was that in uh, 2014, the city decided to build a hospital campus more downtown and eventually ended up with an uh, empty building. Uh, and then that time, uh, the city was really thinking that, you know, we want to focus more on startups and tech and innovation, et cetera. Like, what should we do with the building? Um, and at the same time, the local uh, startup community was thinking that we would really like to have a place uh, where we can uh, be working from together uh, and also eventually having uh, VCs, uh, corporate partners, and other relevant ecosystem players to come uh, and basically be working from 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 uh, the same uh, facilities, etc. And uh, what basically happened was that the city said that, "Hey, we have an empty hospital building. Please uh, make the best out of it." And in a way, kind of like gave the ownership to the local startup to community uh, to take over the hospital and eventually make a, a community place uh, for startups, VCs, partners and ecosystem players um, to come together and, you know, just be growing uh, together. And uh, as for today, we are representing uh, 170 early stage startups. Um, in addition to that, we have 12 VCs, Nordic VCs, who are headquartered uh, at Maria 01. And in addition to that, we have about 20 ecosystem players who are running accelerator programs, tech events, uh, etc., uh, sitting at Maria, Maria 01. And basically what we're doing is it's about providing a space for these uh, stakeholders to come together and eventually grow together. Uh, the biggest asset, what I would say, is the people in-house. So we're always putting the community at core of everything we are doing and really coming up with the best ways of how can we 
ensure that the startups and the entrepreneurs and everybody are growing, uh, growing together. So we are running various programs uh, together with the partners that the startups can take part of. Uh, together with the VCs, we're doing office hour sessions and one-on-ones where the VCs can be uh, sparring and mentoring our, our startup members. And also together with some of the corporates, we're also running uh, venturing programs that are focusing on entrepreneurship, etc. So really what's at the core is to, to bring the people, people together and ensure that everybody are, are growing um, together. And something that is fair also mentioning related to the startups is that when they are uh, applying to become a member of Maria01, uh, and then if they eventually get accepted to the community, the idea is really that they can stay in the building for about three years, but the plan is really for them to grow out from the community as well, to kind of like also ensure that we have a rotation of startups coming in and growing out, uh, and also to put a bit of pressure on them as well to to kind of like have ambitious goals and, and grow out of the community. Awesome. I mean, I feel like I have so many questions to, to ask related to, to that overview, but maybe we'll just tap on um, one of the, the things that you, you touched on here um, and this, this acceptance process for, for entrepreneurs, because, you know, one, one approach is to kind of welcome and accept um, every single startup into, into an, an innovation center versus having some sort of criteria and an in intake process. So what does that look like for you and, and how has that had an impact on the quality of the, the program in general? That's an excellent question. Um, so we don't like to call ourselves an exclusive community because in the end, if you are uh, a tech startup that is really like fulfilling all of the criteria we have in the application process, the opportunity of actually getting access to the house and being an official member of Maria01 uh, is pretty much straightforward. Uh, but looking into the criteria, uh, we really want to focus on good tech startup teams. So obviously having the tech uh, aspect uh, to the company is very re relevant. Uh, in addition to that, we also like to look into who are the founders, who are the people in the team, uh, and also looking into various aspects into, for instance, diversity and who, what are the backgrounds of all the people, uh, etc. In addition to that, uh, we'd like to see that they have some sort of an MVP uh, already uh, built and maybe even some customers as well. Uh, but really being in like the sweet spot is sort of like the pre-seed uh, stage. And then also uh, preferably uh, they should have some sort of funding also uh, in place. And uh, with the team, we are running these screening meetings on a weekly basis. So there's applications coming in um, every week. Uh, but at the same time, uh, as, as we have the rotation of startups, there's like every week somebody moving in, but as well somebody who is eventually moving out. And usually the, the reason why they are moving out of the community is because they just need a bigger office space. And obviously that's a, a good, good reason to leave. Great. Um, great. Well, let's move on to Remington. Thanks, Brianne. Um, I guess the first thing I wanted to highlight is that Houston is very similar to Calgary in a lot of ways. It's a big company city, a oil and gas city, certainly, uh, with a very conservative culture, very safety driven culture. Uh, and all of those factors have, as many uh, of the attendees on this call have probably experienced, uh, posed challenges to creating a really frothy innovation ecosystem uh, here in Houston, but, but uh, you know, across the eastern part of Texas, pretty much everything east of, east of Austin. Um, and you know, when we think about people, programs, and places, the, uh, you know, we have a borrow to build strategy. So we want to be able to tap into all of the expertise and frankly, the capital base of these incumbent industries, whether that's energy uh, or healthcare, uh, Texas, Houston has the Texas Medical Center, which is one of the larger medical centers, medical campuses in the world, uh, NASA as well, NASA Johnson Space Center. Uh, and so we tap into all of the experts uh, at these organizations to surround our startups with really high quality mentors and, and provide micro 
micro communities for specific interests or industries to support knowledge sharing and collaboration. Um, we have entrepreneurs and residents on staff. And then uh, similar to Jessica, uh, Jessica's organization have venture firms and corporate venture groups that office right in our spaces. Uh, on the programming side, we have our own angel network um, that has invested now and now probably about 10 or 11 of the companies uh, in our spaces at Series uh, C through, through Series B. Uh, we do a lot of reverse pitches with fortune companies, many of the oil majors, but NASA as well. Uh, we have crisis support teams, which we, uh, we developed during COVID when so many of our startups were being negatively impacted by the pandemic. We tapped on experts around our community to jump in, um, you know, in a 10 to 15 hours a week capacity uh, to help save those companies. That was a hugely successful program uh, and also helped us retain a lot, of, uh, a lot of our members by helping them stay alive. And then for this group, the other thing I wanted to highlight is we do a lot of cross-border programming to become a soft landing pad for startups coming in from other countries. We do a lot of work with the Canadian Consulate in Houston and the Canadian Trade Commission. Uh, and we've done several events where we've hosted companies from Calgary, Alberta specifically, and set up events for them to pitch to BP Ventures Chevron, Marathon, or Amco, uh, mainly oil and gas programming is what we've done historically, but increasingly clean energy, clean tech programming, uh, and healthcare programming as well. Um, and, and we have um, probably a dozen or so Calgary-based or Alberta-based startups in our community that uh, use our spaces and leverage our programming whenever they're in town for, for business. And then on the places side of things, you know, we do take a network model. Uh, as I mentioned, we have several locations with more on the way. Um, and, and our goal is ultimately create, to create an open system uh, where each place is a little different. Each place, uh, we want to reflect the characteristics of the community or neighborhood or state or area uh, that it is in, uh, but then to connect the people within those specific communities and places to each other. Uh, and we, uh, we just launched uh, several, maybe six months ago, a uh, social platform, kind of like LinkedIn, just for our internal community, which uh, obviously has been hugely valuable during the pandemic. Um, and so that's, those are some of the things that we're doing um, and, uh, you know, definitely want to echo some of what has already been said. Um, I, I did want to mention that Hugo, uh, I, you know, obviously totally agree with the idea of focusing on impact, but, but I will say from our perspective here in Houston, focusing on impact, which we all want to do, can be hard when major stakeholders and decision makers in the community have never heard about accelerators or incubators and don't even understand venture capital as an asset class. It's hard to get people to understand what impact looks like when they don't even have that base level of knowledge. And uh, while I think many of us detest or, or uh, at least tolerate innovation theater, as Hugo called it, which is, a, I love that term. Um, you know, it's something that here in Houston, we've, we've found that we have to tolerate and leverage. Um, and while we never want to generate activity over productivity, um, the activity sometimes generates awareness and education that is necessary to then get to the next stage of, of productivity, uh, which is something we've experienced here in Houston. Yeah, so, I mean, the, I think that we need to spend just a bit more time on this concept of KPIs and impact because, um, you know, there's so many different ways you could go about doing this for an innovation center. How do you quantify impact? So, uh, Remington, it would be great to hear from you on what your thoughts are on that. How should impact be measured? What should the KPIs that a great innovation center actually benchmarks itself against? Well, you know, and I think it's going to be different for every innovation center, right, based on the specific needs of their community, of the, the startups they're working with. I mean, one of the things that we were dealing with initially here in Houston was anytime uh, a startup was moderately successful and got past seed and maybe was approaching Series A, they'd leave Houston for Austin. Uh, across industries, even oil and gas, they'd, they'd still leave Houston for Austin. And so our attrition rate to Austin, um, you know, was initially a problem that we uh, set out to solve. And so one of our KPIs was, was retention and then, you know, kind of reclaiming some of those startups that had moved to other cities such as Austin. Um, and we've actually been able to pull companies, pull startups at A and B rounds back from Austin and even from California over the last year. So we've gotten better at that. Um, but as the Canon, as an organization, as we expand beyond Houston, we're starting to change those KPIs because our story now is more about uh, what we want to be about going forward. Uh, are we connecting, are we creating constructive connections that unlock value across different borders, whether those are city borders or national borders, uh, state borders, and, uh, and so now one of the things we track is 
how many of our companies hire from places like Oklahoma, where we have a strong presence, and uh, how many of the investors in our network are investing in Oklahoma and vice versa. Uh, and so creating that open system, that open network concept where um, we can bring net new energy and net new fuel into these communities that they normally would not have access to is a big part of our, uh, of our objective set today. Super insightful. Um, maybe uh, if there are any other KPIs from, from the panel in general that you want to comment on being particularly helpful in your own ecosystems, I'll just kind of open it up there. So for, Abby, sure. for us, you know, we think about, um, we think about momentum and change over time. And so we track some basic things, you know, number of new startups, number of companies still in business after a period of time, how much uh, capital do they raise collectively? Um, how many new jobs do they create? Those are the kinds of things we sort of look to as indicators of health of the ecosystem. There's some other things relative to you know, brand and profile um, uh, and number of, of meaningful connections made amongst different sizes and types of companies, but th those would be sort of table stakes for us. Mm -hmm. And Henna, yeah. Yeah, we have pretty similar reports. So every time we track basically the, the amount of, of jobs created, um, we actually track also the diversity. So how many female and how many male um, uh, uh, employees the, the companies are, are um, uh, attracting. And then we also tracked uh, how much of capital they have raised, both uh, public and private. Um, also, um, you know, that if these are, those are purpose-driven companies, let's say, um, climate action companies, we also try to measure the impact. So how much of, uh, how, how many like percent of carbon uh, uh, oxidants could they ne neutralize? If they are within health tech, how many patients they have helped? Um, and also in, in Stockholm specifically, we also track a lot of like numbers that how many active startups we still have today, uh, how many successful entrepreneurs are staying in the community, Mm -hmm. how much of talents are we circulating? So perhaps, you know, some um, early stage Spotify uh, employee probably now has their own company or are supporting next generation of startups. So those kind of like statistics as well um, with the city of Stockholm and also a thing we're tracking, of course, you know, the key figures of the companies. Uh, but I, I would also say it depends of, of the company and, you know, that what kind of company do you have since if you have, let's say, a clean tech company, of course, it's very important for you to actually track the KPIs to your investors and, uh, and to your customers as well um, when it comes to reduced carbon emissions, for instance. Great. Well, we can come back to that later if there's any other comments that, that the group has, but why don't, we, um, why don't we hand the mic to Satish to talk a little bit more about New Lab and New Lab's programming. Yeah, and I'll, I'll, I'll use the KPIs uh, discussion as a thread to talk about New Lab. I think we, you know, we, 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 we are like the, our, my peers on the panel here, I think we're, we're, we're pretty much the same in terms of how we measure ourselves and sort of a lot of our missions and goals. We're, we were raised by public and private capital, so we cer certainly have to be mission driven, but at the same time think and act like a business because uh, we are a business. Um, you know, increasingly, I think New Lab is starting to look at this as trying to be a problem solver. So in some ways, taking on the same mindset as, as the companies that we serve. Um, and so, for example, now when we look at engaging the community in New York or expanding to a place like Detroit, we, we enter those regions saying, um, saying we're trying to help you solve a challenge that, that's important to your region. For Detroit, it's right now, a lot of that is around mobility, um, connecting disparate neighborhoods and taking advantage of the leadership that the state of Michigan has had in, in the world of automotive and transforming that region into an EV and mobility sort of uh, equitable future. And so when we come in with a program, that program is, is bringing in startups and working on product development activities and getting the pilot opportunities. And by solving those problems, we build, that's how we build our next ecosystem. And that's exactly what's been happening in New York when we, when we started with a seed group of companies, bespoke services to help them grow, but then started solving problems for the city around urban tech, around, around climate, um, that helped startups come and deploy products in the region um, and help them use that data to raise venture capital and ultimately grow. There was a reason to stick in, in this area. And so now I feel like when New Lab goes out into another world, we say, you know, what are your sustainability goals? What are your challenges in energy? What, what is the thing that your region cares about? We're going to help you solve that. And we're going to do that by bringing this ecosystem to bear 
and guide them through this process. So um, our KPIs are measured by in terms of economic the standard economic development, but as well like as I, I think Hannah was talking about um, increasingly climate um, metrics, right? So if we're taking on dollars to support energy or carbon reduction, are we making an impact in that space? If we're talking about industrial automation, what are the metrics that are involved in that? So um, it's interesting. I think, yes, we'll always track venture dollars raised and job creation, but I think we're, we're also gonna start measuring ourselves against really industry specific KPIs as well. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that that you've had a ton of success in this approach and Remington had touched on this as well, is this, this uh, open line of communication between the innovation ecosystem and the community and listening to needs and understanding gaps and filling and kind of creating this like very robust line between the two. Um, it's, and, and clearly with, with Remington's example with the COVID crisis support, like that's, I mean, that's very innovative for an innovation ecosystem to be, to be listening and kind of ad hoc creating programming like that. Um, maybe this is this is sort of a question for the the group in general. Uh, what does that scanning of a local ecosystem look like? Like what and whose role is that within within your groups to to continue to be sort of looking out and pulling in expertise, understanding needs and addressing them, and understanding needs in the community and, and then helping to address them within that that center. Oh, yeah, go ahead, Remington. Uh, thanks, Satish. I, Satish, I'll, I'll be brief here. Um, you know, one of the things that we at the Canon are, are big proponents of is, is what the famous 20th century urbanist Jane Jacobs called walking the streets. Um, whenever we go and look at a new site where we want to put a hub, you know, of course we have um, cooperation from the local economic development group and those types of, of parties to help us get an understanding of the, the market uh, that we're entering. But, uh, you know, what that doesn't give you is the qualitative dimension, which I think is really important. And, and so one of the things we like to do is, is, you know, hand select just different business owners, different employees of major companies in the area, go to the local restaurants and, and, you know, tour the local cultural attractions, um, and, and really just get a qualitative sense for the culture and environment in which our location will live. Um, and, and so we do that at the outset of, of uh, every new location we, we launch. Yeah, I would, I would say the way we the way we like to look at I, I think uh, ecosystems is is also around um, what we think are like the emerging themes that are happening there. What's the what's the what's the state or the city supporting in terms of their own funding initiatives? Is it, is it at the research level? Is it the startup level? Is it at the industry partnership level? Um, and then and then is there is there sort of a source of talent that we see there that traditionally might might leave to other places but might be interested in staying if there is a landing pad like a new lab, right? And so. Um, we look for major universities with engineering programs. We look for, um, you know, venture capital dollars that have gone into that state previously. If there's a growth opportunity for that, um, if you are already able to tap into a certain industry. And so um, I, I take it back to New Lab looking at it as, as can we solve some sort of some really major challenges? And, and that creates these business opportunities where startups that are homegrown would be willing to stay. And just as importantly, others from outside the region would be willing to move their, move their businesses there. And I think that's a huge value had for places for a lot of states in the United States that we've been speaking with. Yeah, I would agree there. I mean, um, Sting, for instance, we are owned by a uh, foundation and the owners of the foundation are a public-private um, collaboration groups, basically. Uh, so there are some large Swedish corporates um, and also the city or the region of Stockholm um, and also um, the KTH, so the Royal Technology School here. So. Um, that kind of like collaborations that you immediately, um, you know, have tight relationships with all the ecosystem players, I think it's very, very important. Uh, but in, in some sense, I think, you know, politicians, they can also affect, uh, at least in that sense, that if they, if they, if they assign a like clear will, like Jessica said, that they got free hands on Bill, like using the space, um, or if they have, you know, this kind of like a target, let's say they, Swedish government at some point they had they had a target that they really want to make uh, Sweden as the first cash free society um, and today we have so many so many like successful fintech companies I don't know is there you know confidence in it or not but it's something that it's still very uh, interesting that the, the government actually like notched um, the players within the fintech market in that sense because that was a very strong 
um, you know, kind of like will from uh, from uh, the uh, politicians. So um, I, I think it's very important to include many different players. I could maybe uh, add to what also Henna said about in general um, local communities. Well, in Finland, but in Nordics as a whole, we've been very sort of well known of being communities that are sort of focused on the grassroots level and the aim of everything every time when like creating something new whether it's like you know building a community house for startups and VCs or creating a uh, event such as for instance slush uh, there has always been sort of the local community grassroots movements around um, all of those initiatives um, and kind of like for the local entrepreneurs and the community to take lead on uh, various initiatives that are crucial uh, for the startups uh, during that time. I think one good concrete example, for instance, uh, related to the Nordic startup scene is, uh, for instance, uh, the tech event uh, Slush, uh, which was founded in 2008. And uh, a great example there is that the entrepreneurs were basically coming together uh, and they were thinking that, hey, we need an event that would gather uh, international investors. And, you know, how can we make sure that even more Nordic entrepreneurs are meeting these uh, international VCs? Um, and hence Slush was founded and uh, has been growing ever since to become uh, one of the most uh, impactful uh, tech and startup events on a global level uh, as well. Uh, and a great uh, sort of like insight to that as well is that it's been student run uh, ever since 2010. Uh, so really giving the ownership to the local startup community to, to solve whatever problem uh, the community is facing at that time. And I think like Maria01 was also an example related to actually creating a community space where everybody are coming together in the city of Helsinki and uh, build businesses uh, together and grow and make, make, make the city as well uh, to stand out on a global scale. Great. So I think I mean, maybe we'll just pull on that thread a bit um, in terms of the, how your cities have changed over, over the past, uh, five to 10 years and and then also just specifically what role uh what role do you think your organizations have played in um fostering encouraging being being sort of a spark for for that type of change and and the welcoming of of tech and innovation within your communities um let's start with satish this time Thanks. Um, so, um, you know, our HQ is in New York, so I'll try and kind of maybe talk about the area where I'm broken because New York as a city, of course, is changing, is always changing. Um, so so I, I think from a broader level, like being here for now in, in the area for 10 years and, and being a researcher and working in the academic kind of space before joining New Lab, um, I, the city has definitely been investing a lot in applied sciences and initiatives and in making New York a place that's friendly for tech development. Um, and if you think about where that started is, is we certainly have a host of amazing hospital systems and academics. The life science aspect of this is of course uh, should be pushed and it has been. Um, on the engineering side, funding for places like a new lab and, and identifying places where hardware companies come work is what led for us to, to build a community that then started attracting software companies and basically building this frontier tech focused community um, here in the area of Brooklyn. And so the area where we're in, I'll just tell that story, is like this is a 300 acre campus that's owned by the by the Navy and leased the Brooklyn Navy Yard uh, Corporation to manage this, this area that's now becoming an innovation district for Brooklyn. And so Brooklyn by itself has actually been going up pretty fast in terms of growth rate for tech startups because of the work that New Lab's been able to do and what that sort of generated by in, in the area that was once a factory center for the country um, during the during the two two world wars actually. Um, so bringing those bringing that sort of uh, center of gravity back to this area has been a pretty pretty stark change over the last five years where we went from maybe you know a thousand employees to now up to twenty thousand in this campus. A big grocery store um, opened up down the street. You've got more restaurants popping up around the area. And, and it's because you're, it's, it's exactly what the ecosystem development is all about. You, you, you build something, you show this great activity happening, and it just gets other people interested in, in joining or being your neighbor. Um, and so there's been a lot of change in the, in the specific kind of neighborhood that, that New Life has been in, in a, in a very positive way. Awesome. All right, Jessica. Yes. Mm. 
I'd say that the city um, in Helsinki has played an important role in that extent that it's always been very supportive to the local uh, startup community. Uh, one thing that is fair to mention related to Maria 01 is that we have three owners and the city of Helsinki is one of them. So uh, every time there's always, of course, maybe some uh, big delegations or, or important people, so to say, visiting Helsinki, they always also like to show them uh, Maria 01 and, and kind of like give a glimpse uh, into the, the startup community, uh, etc. But also uh, the city of Helsinki have also their own sort of startup initiatives, uh, but they still want to focus more on giving uh, the exposure to the community startups events and programs by featuring them in newsletters and uh, also by connecting people who are coming uh, from outside the startup community and wants to, for instance, land a job in a startup or start their own company. So they are really good at also directing these uh, people to the right initiatives uh, in the in the startup community. Um, so those would be the, the great things related to that. Great. I'm just curious um, uh, for the panel, how many uh, organizations here have the city or cities in which you exist as either investors or um, invested stakeholders? In, in your centers. So, five. <laughs> All right. Okay. okay, let's let's go to Hugo. The last five to ten years. Well, I can only speak for the last three because I've been yeah. living here for three years and I wasn't <laughs> keeping tab on Frankfurt uh, prior. <laughs> but um, small sample. But I guess from the time that I was here is. It's a bit of a boring answer, but just the, the amount of interest and also activity uh, in the startup ecosystem. So like I said before, Tech Fortier, there was barely a, any space where events were held on a regular basis. So that has helped to bring uh, sort of a spotlight on, on the scene and just uh, catalyze a little bit the different founders that were a bit of a galaxy uh, prior. Um, I think one side effect that of this is that's really good and uh, welcomed has been the um, uh, the interest also from the, the talent pool I was referring to, so the students in the region. Typically, the career path has always been, you know, you finish school, you go do two, three internships, one at Accenture, Deutsche Bank, Deloitte. Uh, it was like always the, this uh, path. But I like to think that the TQ has brought an, an outside option here and that we now, you know, students, they think, oh, maybe I'll do one of my internships for one of those startups, right? So there's the, really this aspect of education, uh, around the possibility to make uh, uh, valuable professional experiences in the startup scene. So just by uh, the very fact of our existence and us curating a community there. Great, um, Abby. When I think about sort of how the, the nature of the communities changed over the last decade, I think, um, for us, what we've seen is the, the ecosystem has grown up a little. So, um, you know, a dozen years ago, we had relatively few startup companies around town. Uh, there were some mid-sized tech firms and one giant research in motion. Uh, we started at that time to spend a lot of energy and effort into cultivating the startup ecosystem because uh, we knew that our funnel had essentially collapsed. There, there was no, you know, robust uh, funnel of early stage companies. So uh, fast forward about five or six years, and we were able to uh, spend a lot of time and energy building that, that early generation of startup firms in the community, some of whom um, uh, have gone on to be scaling firms and, you know, full-blown $100 million plus enterprises. I think it, it was uh, only, I'll say, three or four years ago where we really started to see the fruit of that early work kind of accelerate through the funnel. Um, and the key has been we, we still need to cultivate that very robust startup pipeline in order to make sure that that next generation of scaling firms continues on. Uh, and so we've, we have had to learn how to provide the right kinds of programming for those scale-up clients 
uh, who've grown up with us, essentially, we've had to build, you know, for their latest need or their latest um, requirement. So we've had to kind of adapt alongside them. What it's given us as a community, though, is uh, lots of great hero stories so that, you know, those first time entrepreneurs can actually see the company that's only two or three years older than theirs is. Uh, and can watch that journey, can actually reach out and have a conversation with that founder or that um, leadership team. And so it's, it, it's uh, in, in one way, it allows us to make sure that, um, that our founders are giving back because they're now mentoring, you know, the generation that's coming right up behind them, uh, which is another way we, we are able to maintain connectivity to the ecosystem. They're, uh, they're, they're appreciative of you know, the companies or the, the founders that helped them and are now paying it forward. It's, I mean, it's so interesting, like this common thread of how, how really entrepreneurial and innovative your organizations have to be to make this work. Um, because it's obviously such a moving target to do this well and to deliver value within a community. It's an impressive what, what you've all done to, 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 to watch, listen and adapt um, to continue to deliver the most value you can. Um, great, Remington. Uh, thanks, Grant. So, interestingly, about five years ago, uh, Houston uh, essentially had zero accelerators or incubators, um, which is astonishing considering Houston's the fourth, almost third largest city in the United States. Uh, and uh, in the last four to five years, that number has gone from practically zero to about 27. Uh, different platforms and programs. And, and so the last five years has, have just seen an explosion of interest and activity uh, around uh, startups, innovation, venture capital. There is a lot of uh, traditional family office and private equity money that, that historically has only played in oil and gas and real estate that is now coming into the Houston venture market. Um, and so that's you know, fueling a lot, of the, a lot of the growth and a lot of the interest. The city has taken a greater interest as have the, both uh, universities, major universities here in Houston, uh, Rice University and University of Houston, uh, put more emphasis on their own programming. So, you know, a confluence of, of all these factors and the momentum that has been compounding has uh, really dramatically changed the, the Houston startup ecosystem just in the last few years. Um, and, uh, you know, I think one of the challenges we're, we're facing with that is we now in, in some ways have more supply of startup support organizations than we have startups that can actually take advantage of them. Um, and, and so, you know, as, as we all know, uh, as, hard it is, as hard as it is to establish an innovation hub or, you know, build an innovation ecosystem, it's as hard or if not harder to scale a successful startup. And so in many ways, the ecosystem is now waiting for its startups to, to catch up. And, and, you know, to Hugo's earlier phrase on innovation theater, I think one of the reasons that, that we have not been able to ensure our startups keep pace with the growth of supply is because early on, too many people were focused on innovation theater and not actually uh, adding value and creating impact. And I think that that is a, a lot of what is accounted for the lag we're now seeing. Interesting. Uh, yeah, I mean, I could speak from experience that so much of the focus in the early days is on the pitch and the story and the pitch and the story. And then it's like, you kind of get to a certain point and you've got to now actually figure out how to grow a business. <laughs> like there's a, there's been a bit of a disconnect there. So, okay. Um, Hannah. Yeah. So, um, Stockholm is a city. It's a very like success, successful startup uh, city, probably one of the most well-known European startup cities. And in that sense, we are very like mature enough also. Um, but something is what I think is very special within Stockholm that we don't have, you know, only one niche in that sense. Um, so there are lots of like successful companies within different industries. Uh, we have music tech, we have games, we have uh, deep tech, uh, fashion, so on. So it is very, you know, wide spectrum of different startups. And that is, of course, this, a huge strength uh, of the city that we, we are not clustered in that sense. Um, if I would highlight one specific sector, I would say fintech is probably the strongest. Uh, but now we're really seeing in these couple of past years that, you know, that impact and uh, climate action and those kind of like companies, it, it's really mainstream at the moment. So 
only like a few years ago, people were discussing about impact driven companies and it felt that it's only like some kind of like, let's say impact department uh, that was speaking about those kind of initiatives. Uh, but now it's like everybody is talking about impact. All the investors are asking impact reports and impact KPIs. Um, so that is just, you know, it, it's, it's just to become like mainstream. And that is, of course, very interesting and very, very encouraging to see as well. Um, but also to echo here what um, Hugo also said about this, um, that the talent story, it also the path has changed. So previously, uh, I know that the larger co corporates and the banks and um, even private equity companies, they have struggles like actually attracting talent since most of the people actually want to join startups instead. So that is very something that, you know, that they, uh, it's very like hot at the moment to be working in the startup industry, which is super positive, of course. Um, but but we also at the same time we have the lack of of talents. Funny enough, so there are like there are so many startups, and I know that there are lots of talents who would like to um, to to start working with startups. But at the same time, uh, Stockholm, as in most of the European cities, um, we are still having this issue that we don't find uh, enough of tech talent. So that is probably the biggest weakness that we're facing at the moment. Um, but also something like within changes. Um, that I think is very important as well and very interesting here that we have those successful stories as Avi were also saying about these uh, heroes. So it, it's very interesting that, you know, that you have those early day startup founders who now, who became angel investors and they perhaps started their own venture capital firms. We now saw Daniel Ek uh, announcing at, at the Slush events that they, uh, he wants to do more investment within deep tech space uh, and also to encourage European companies and innovation to stay inside of Europe. Uh, so we see those kind of like, um, you know, successful founders who really want to back the entire community and give them resources uh, to them as well. So that is very positive as well that we see more and more of these kind of stories. Very cool. Um, so we're going to just transition now into some more Q&A from the audience. I know that, so I'll just encourage everybody in the audience to make sure you submit your questions if you want them to be discussed here. Um, a, and a couple of comments were made over the course of this on um, the some of the other stakeholders within, within a community ecosystem, um, including universities uh, and and I know that there have been a, a, f a few um, comments made about investors and the roles that that actually physically bring investors, physically bringing investors into the the centers, um, has done for each of you. So maybe we can just start by having, and this will be a question for anybody who wants to jump in. Um, how have you um, had success in navigating and and structuring those relationships with? With yourself and universities within your within your communities, and then also, um, what is the importance of having universities or investors actually physically co-located within your spaces? Abby, if I could start, uh, so we we find the co-location element hugely important because uh, for the entrepreneur um, or the founder. The, the idea of um, reducing friction. So if they need a connection to a research partner or a capital provider uh, or a specialized advisor of some kind, our job is to take all the barriers and obstacles away that we can. And if they can simply wander down the hall and drop in and have a chat uh, with somebody who's keeping office hours or is physically located on site, uh, that's one of the ways we've been able to take down those barriers. Obviously that's changed uh, through the course of the pandemic when we've got reduced access to the facilities themselves. But what we have been able to do is uh, migrate a lot of those chance encounters and networking opportunities into this kind of digital format. So pre-existing relationships, uh, monthly peer group meetings, or ask me anything, lunchtime sessions with some of our in-house experts. Those are the ways that people are now finding that kind of help and advice. For us, the relationships with our local universities and college are hugely important because uh, not only are those institutions the, the talent engines of our local ecosystem, they're also 
um, they are in and of themselves um, attracting attention and you know research investment and other kinds of uh, partners to the community that perhaps we wouldn't have the ability to attract on our own. So collectively, we're shining a big spotlight on the startup community and trying to draw as many eyeballs and investment dollars as we can. Right. I could jump in here. Um, so we at Tech, uh, Tech Quartier, we have two universities that are actually shareholders of uh, Tech Quartier. So the Goethe University and the TU Darmstadt. Technical University and, um, you know, hugely important relationships as well. Uh, like Avi said, you know, for it's the top of the funnel, if you want to see it as a funnel, but it's really where the, the minds are, are really evolving and then, uh, you know, possibly um, giving way to founding aspirations and creating businesses. So it's really the, the earlier stage. So that's, that's important for us to nurture it. Um, so it's again this bridge idea that we, we want to be a bridge as well between the startup scene and we create several programs, for instance, where talents take part and they develop innovative concepts and ideas in a hackathon format for corporate partners. So it's actually sometimes a three-way co-created format that we have. Um, also a very valid point about attracting the talent, right? So we're all in the same boat regionally here to you know, bring in international interest and international students. And then finally, on the point of expertise, that's also true. So for instance, the uh, business school and the finance department at the Goethe University, that's where we, uh, we have, for instance, some AI experts specifically on the field, uh, you know, relevant to the field of finance that we invite to take part in our curated workshops. Uh, so, so we have that uh, expertise tie as well with the teaching uh, body, not only the students. Um, I can maybe add to that if that's okay. Um, I think in general, on a global scale, like the attitude towards entrepreneurship has changed a lot for the last 10, 15, 20 years. Like, I think a concrete example, just looking at the Nordics, for instance, when you asked a bunch of students, like, 15 years ago like who could consider becoming an entrepreneur in the future and there was not that many hands that went up in the air compared to what the situation is today where sort of like the ultimate goal for a lot of young uh, people uh, is to you know become entrepreneurs or joining uh, a startup company um, etc and at least what comes to um, Maria 01 and working with the universities in in Helsinki, and as I mentioned previously as well, like the whole startup community in Helsinki has been very student run due to, for instance, the students organizing slush every year. Uh, so the bridge between the local community and the universities and the students has been very strong uh, from like 10 years ago. Um, and looking into how we are working with the students today, uh, and especially in, in Finland, there's always these entrepreneurial societies uh, in every university that are focusing on inspiring students uh, towards becoming entrepreneurs or joining startups, etc. So together with them, we are organizing events, uh, but also promoting uh, our startup jobs uh, to, the, to the universities and these societies. And also if they wanna organize some events, they can use our space for free. So we just love it when they want to do something in our uh, in our facilities obviously now during covid it's a bit of a different situation organizing physical events but at least for them to have like a, a, a option to do something uh, at maria 01 and in related to this there's also a lot of the university um, entrepreneurial societies that are also organizing their own accelerator programs which are really good so we are also actively uh, promoting these programs to our own entrepreneurs, and uh, a lot of our, our companies are usually also taking place of these, taking part of these uh, programs. So that has been a very good uh, success and collaboration between us and this, all the universities in Helsinki. Awesome, very much a two-way street, helping each other. Okay, any other comments on that before we move on to the next question? Okay, uh, great. So the, the, one of the questions that's come up a couple of times here um, that maybe I'll just open it up to the larger group is, is more about, it's, it's more of a, um, 
a downstream support for for companies that are growing. So I know that there, there's a big there's a big focus on startups and kind of acceleration of early startups and really kind of more shots on goal with more companies within the ecosystem. Um, what successful programs have you had to support uh, companies when they're starting to actually go into new markets and and actually support that market entrance? I I can start with that. So, so um, one of the one of the growth opportunities that's happened for New Lab is, is our innovation studios, and these are studios where um, industry and government partner, partners sponsor a program with the goals of of developing and identifying products that they can deploy within their operations or for themselves to grow new businesses. So, for example, we run a program with Verizon, um, who installed a private five G network and edge compute stack here at New Lab to be sort of a pre testing site. Um, with the goal of finding um, essentially companies working in industrial automation or energy or transportation that can supercharge their products um, with 5G. And there's an opportunity here for them to partner with Verizon and sort of go together towards transforming an industry. And so this is something that's great for early stage companies, but just as powerful, if not more, for the later stage companies that have, have raised capital, have engineering staffs, have products in market. And this is an expansion opportunity, right? If, if, you, if you can put 5G on your robot and take compute off the, off, off the hardware, you've got longer battery life, you can now make them smaller, which means you can, you can solve bigger, different types of problems in industries like that. We're doing this with Ford in our mobility studio based in Michigan. We're doing this with a mining company based in India called the Vimsing Group um, to create sustainable practices in mining. And so in order to get into those industries, sometimes you do need to be a little more mature. And, and, and what, when those companies come to us, they see this as, as strictly an expansion opportunity, Brian, as you pointed out, because um, that's, that's it's essentially shrink, shrinking the enterprise sales cycle for them, which is what a lot of our companies are working in. Yeah, I mean, clearly you're functioning very much as connective tissue between all of the different parts yeah. of this ecosystem, big, big uh, potential corporate partners included. So, Hannah. Yeah. Um, I was also thinking here, like building partnerships in that sense, and that's thing we we have also partnerships with different uh, other cities um, across Europe mainly. So basically, when the startups are expanding after after their path at Sting, it's usually the Nordic countries that they first look at. And there we have a good collaboration with Jessica and Maria as well. Uh, so we can send our companies to Finland and then, and then uh, with some other, you know, actors in Norway, Denmark, uh, Germany, UK. Um, it is usually the European um, countries that the companies look, look first to. Um, we also, we are part of GAN, which is a uh, global accelerator network. So um, in that sense, we have a very good, um, you know, collaboration board with different accelerators across the world. And they have very um, high focus in space as well. So we have uh, some collaborations there as well. But, you know, the, the, I, th I would say that the key, key thing is, of course, to help our startups to become um, that they, they will raise investments. So in that sense that they will raise uh, venture capital, they will raise later than seed round. So the investors, the venture capital uh, companies are then actually backing the companies when it's time for them to um, to expand and uh, they have their networks and they're helping, helping of course, the companies forward. And we uh, at Sting, then of course, we, we have different events, um, matchmaking events for VCs and, and our companies as well, no matter if they uh, already are, you know, if they have graduated from Sting and our alumni companies, but we still support them very uh, heavily after that. Um, we also support them like creating connections with, with corporates since uh, you actually need the sales uh, as well in order to become a sustainable company uh, and, you know, to have a decent income as well. So that is something that we really highlight and support them to finding a good, good uh, potential customers as well. Um, so I would say that it's a two, two roles that we help them, you know, to, to we, we are creating partnerships at Sting in order to support them, but also um, we really want to, the companies to become successful and try to um, try to get, you know, to investors to invest them and get the customers for the companies in order for them, of course, to back uh, the companies to become even larger ones. Mm -hmm. uh, I can what, maybe, oh, sorry. Go, oh, go ahead, Jessica. Uh, no. All right. I was just about to say, uh, to add what uh, Henna said as well, like, yes, as mentioned, we have a, also a collaboration in that sense that um, if any of our startups would visit Stockholm or are interested in a program, we can just direct them to, to Sting, et cetera, and vice versa. And that has been a really good, uh, good collaboration and partnership previously. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we also see that since we are working with a fairly large community, our main task is to really identify the right opportunities and sort of create the best partnerships 
um, through through understanding what is it actually that our startups uh, are needing. And I think like a good example related to having the VCs headquartered uh, next to the startups is a pretty concrete example of like how it, the setup has usually been is like VCs sitting in their ivory tower and the startups coming to kind of like beg for money. But that has sort of changed for the last years that VCs really need to establish good relationship with early stage teams and kind of like get to know the teams in a very uh, early phase in order to perhaps later uh, invest in them. And that's also one of the reasons why we're really excited to have these uh, VCs uh, sitting next to our startups uh, at Maria01 and kind of like, yeah, for them to create these really valuable uh, relationships in an early phase as well. Mm -hmm. Um, Brian, I wanted to add, I mean, one of the more atypical things that we have found helpful um, to Hannah's point about these corporates being customers and as you get to a later stage and or have IP or technology that's at a higher technology readiness level, uh, what you really need is customers. And uh, one of the things that we encountered early on, and this, this kind of touches on, I see a comment here in the chat to the panelists on, you know, the challenge for Calgary being industry engagement when the community is just forming. And, and we have that same experience and challenge in Houston. And the way we solve that, actually, uh, because it's hard to convince corporates, incumbent companies, that they should look at these startups when, you know, they really don't have any conception of startups, value, unique challenges and engagement models, um, you know, how to, uh, you know, bring these pilots into their organization. And so there's an a priori, both educational and process barrier that we found prevented uh, major companies from taking on some of, some of our later stage startups as customers. So what we ended up doing is forming a professional services arm that essentially helped those companies, including the number of the oil majors, design and develop their pilot program and startup ingestion, startup product ingestion strategies and frameworks and processes uh, so that there would be an avenue for these startups to become customers. Um, and at a lot of the oil majors, for example, uh, those processes and practices just did not exist. So we had to help them create them first before we could start, um, for before our companies could start landing them as customers. Awesome. On that point, maybe I just quickly add an example of what we did is uh, we created a program called Compliance Navigator because it's, you know, fintech and large banks, uh, there's a lot of red tape, uh, a lot of regulatory um, things you have to think about, especially in Germany. So we, uh, in our role, again, as bridge builder, we created this program with uh, PwC, Atos, and Equans Worldline, where we, for a week, you know, brought in uh, representatives, startups, 10 startups, but also um, representatives from industry and explaining, you know, how to accelerate this, uh, this go-to-market process. So this, this is an example of uh, solving a pain point that's just really how to get both uh, the same room and talking the same language. Awesome. Okay, um, we have about five minutes left in the Q and A. So um, the the direction that I love to take this is um, kind of back to to Calgary uh, here, and and um, you know we're very we're very early in sort of starting and building this ecosystem and this central place for for gathering and connectivity um, within that ecosystem. Um, Maybe some gems, any gems that you have for us that we haven't talked about today that you think we should know to make sure that we do this right, we accelerate it as quickly as possible. Um, what what should we know? Abby? I, I would offer a couple things, um, you know, to take advantage of the significant level of interest and lots of organizations that are coming together and trying to build something great in Calgary. I would say, you know, don't, don't fall into the scarcity mindset. Um, every organization brings something to the table and that just means the pie gets bigger. So don't worry about, you know, who owns which piece or who takes credit for which results. If the goal is generate lots of great entrepreneurial activity and build more companies in Calgary, it doesn't matter which organization is uh, getting the credit for it. Ultimately, Calgary's gonna win. Awesome. Yeah, just to continue from there, I agree 100%. Not, not a person living in Calgary here, but 
uh, I think it's always very important that you really that you collaborate uh, and you you know uh, that you build uh, partnerships with other other players as well. So you really want to have um, all the important players under the one roof, or that you have you know a shared mission uh, that you all know that you want to you want to achieve something together uh, and make some noise around that. I mean be proud what you're doing and give the, the credibility and the, the stage and the, um, you know, the, the, the stage to the successful entrepreneurs and the good examples that you are creating. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, I can go. Um, you know, I, I would say, uh, and again, just drawing on, on um, my experience here in Houston, um, you know, one of the things that, that we found that, I, you know, I imagine is probably very similar in Calgary is that the, the challenge is, is greater than just the innovation ecosystem or the startup ecosystem. There's a cultural challenge uh, as well, um, you know, across the broader city, across the, the province. Um, and, and so, you know, I would just, you know, encourage folks to remember, you know, don't don't silo and create an insular innovation community. The way these things move forward is by being open and, you know, participating in, you know, the broader cultural conversation around why startups and innovation are important. Um, and, and so, you know, it's not just about our, our types of organizations and the startups that self-select to be a part of them, but there's also a, a, bro a broader kind of mind shift or thought shift that has to happen uh, in order for these things to gain momentum. Great advice. Yeah, yeah hard, uh, very much agree on that. We tend to sometimes see uh, things in our bubble and it's important to connect it to, let's call it real life. Or, but um, no, that's great. I, I would add to, to uh, what Avi said, maybe it's a, when everybody's sort of there's this buzz you know around what you're building everybody's excited um i think there's a lot of opportunities coming as well so sometimes as the platform calgary for instance there can be almost a too much choice or too many directions that you could chase and too many rabbits at once so i know for us that we have a small team as same to as yours and uh, sometimes uh, there's lures and uh, potential pitfalls and trying to do too many projects we want to be innovative, right? We, we are an innovation center, so we should a little bit. Uh, uh, but the thing is sometimes trying to come up with too many concepts and, and uh, maybe trying to do too much. Uh, so uh, yeah, that would be my, my tidbit, I guess. Yeah, I could actually right away jump into and add to that, that yeah, it's very true that you very easily get excited about a lot of things and suddenly you have a lot of projects going on, et cetera. But one thing that is always good to kind of like ask yourself whenever you're kind of like starting to plan something new or jumping on creating a new local initiative is to ask, is this what the startups are actually needing? Will this sort of like help our local entrepreneurs to become like global uh, tech companies, et cetera? So always having the, the entrepreneurs and the startups in mind and kind of like asking them as well like is this really what's needed at the moment so so parallel to the startup world itself where you know so much so much has to do with what you say yes to and also what you say no to and and you know staying on track and maintaining that vision and not spreading yourself too thin any other comments from anyone before we close off yeah, I was gonna. I, I I think something that Remington said really resonated with me about um, having to, you know, working with industry to sort of work on their startup ingestion. I, I think that was based on a need that you saw Remington, and I think cities can actually do a lot in, in that as well to sort of prime the pump, so to speak, for a, a new ecosystem player to come into town or to help us sort of growing community of startups. So I think New York does a good job of that, for example. So when they're funding, let's say, innovation programs, universities, they're bringing in the major industries that are in New York to come in and somehow be advisors and show them that these, these are the types of, of, of sort of communities you should be tapping into. Um, can you create pilot zones for places like the Brooklyn Navy Yard where, where you don't have to go through the same city ordinances and, and approvals that, that you can here, jump bike, is a great example of that. That was a, that was acquired by Uber. They're able to start pilots in Brooklyn because of the of the of the fast track nature of getting into those opportunities that we could were able to create in this zone here. Um, Detroit does that as well. And so, you know, just think about all the things that a startup needs to do to stay in your in your ecosystem. And then and and how do you prime that pump uh, 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 beforehand by speaking with your industry leaders, speaking with the city organizations that might, that might use those tools that those startups are bringing to bear. 
speaking with neighborhoods and communities that might be like the ones that benefit from from the aspects of, the, of this from a business perspective or from a technology perspective um, there's a lot of work i think that we that the, that the that the cities can do ahead of time and they are doing um, that make these things prime for entities like ourselves to come in and, and really help supercharge that awesome awesome closing point so um, I just want to say a big thank you to, to all of you for joining us today. Um, thank you for all of the care, energy, and thought you've put into your own ecosystems. And thank you for the care, energy, and thought you put into the questions today. Um, I think this is going to really help us in, in terms of getting us on the right track and moving us forward in Calgary. So um, Remington, Jessica, Hugo, Satish, Avi, and Henna, big thank you. Um, I'm gonna pass things over to Terry to close out and um, have a west wonderful rest of your day, evenings, wherever you are. Thank, and I wanna thank, yeah. echo your thanks, uh, Brianne, and thank you uh, for uh, joining us and being a member of our advisory roundtable to make sure that the voice of the entrepreneur is core to um, how we work. Um, when we were, I mean, I just, our name is Platform Calgary, but I, I, and we named ourselves Platform Calgary on purpose to be a platform for our community to build on. But I would say today that we're kind of sponge Calgary because I guarantee you that our entire team, including all of our supporters, we're listening intently to what you've done and you've been in, your organizations have been an inspiration for us in all the dimensions you talked about. Um, and our commitment to Calgarians is that we're giving you a place that if you want to lean in and build this ecosystem, build a company that we will be there for you and we'll translate that effort that you put in into impact. That's our promise. And we have five uh, guiding principles that we've built this uh, organization on to date. Uh, it starts with collaborate first. Second is love founders. Third is build community. Four is think global and five is embrace risk. And I think we saw all of that today. So thank you everybody uh, for being with us. Uh, this series will continue um, because we just think that it's absolutely essential that we build a globally connected ecosystem. Our next um, uh, discussion will be on March the 25th from 8 a.m. to 9.30 a.m. Uh, and what we're focusing on this time is global corporations that have built a business relationship with a Calgary-based tech company or startup that was at one point a startup. So everybody that's here today uh, will get an invitation to that. We're very excited about this topic. It came directly from uh, our advisory roundtable. And I would say that if you have ideas on things you'd like us to cover in this broad theme, please drop them in uh, to our team and we will do our best to bring it together. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Hope you have a fantastic day. We'll see you next month.